Thank you. This one works here, does it? Fantastic. Um, so I've been given the uh, rather large task to talk about um, uh, HIV, HSV interactions. And mindful of the fact that I've only got 15 minutes, I've essentially decided to confine my comments to the question, which is uh, one that's been building for a number of years now, of whether we should be treating herpes virus infection, genital herpes infections, to prevent HIV transmission. So I'm going to spend most of my time talking about uh, HSV infection and acquisition of HIV, talk briefly about the observational data and move on to randomised controlled trial evidence, and then uh, more briefly talk about the other side of the equation, about treatment of herpes in HIV positive people to prevent transmission of HIV um, to others. Okay, so summarising the data in this, in this uh, area of um, uh, um, herpes, HSV and uh, HIV acquisition is made very simple by the fact that last year there was an excellent meta-analysis published on this topic which summarised all prospective evidence and it's important that it be prospective. Cross-sectional evidence is always going to show a very strong association between HSV2 uh, and HIV infection um, and prospective data that is controlled for behaviour. Uh, because again, the behavioural confounding between these two infections is very strong. Um, so this um, data published by Freeman last year showed uh, that among heterosexual men, those infected with HSV2 have about a threefold risk of acquiring um, HIV. In uh, heterosexual women, um, in the general population, there's actually relatively f only relatively few studies, uh, but again, sim very similar magnitude, about a threefold increase um, among people, among women infected with HSV2. There have been a large number of studies in high risk um, uh, heterosexual women, largely sex workers, which show f uh, somewhat less of a protection and, and more divergent results. In men who have sex with men until uh, when this uh, paper was published last year, uh, there had only been four studies showing something less of a, uh, an association, so a, a relative risk of somewhat less than two, still significant, still a doubling of risk in HSV2 infected HIV negative men. Um, and I just wanted to present, uh, to, to add to this, a couple of studies that were published or presented in, uh, since the publication of that, um, of that paper, and the first of which is from the US Explore study, so uh, a very large um, prospective study in HIV-negative homos homosexual men in the US. And in that study, it was found that um, HIV risk was associated with recent HSV2 infection, much more so than those with remote HSV infection. So this is the si similar to the evidence we've seen coming out of... Okay, I'll try. Um, no, but that's okay. I've used this as my pointer anyway. Um, uh, a three and a half fold increase in those with recent HSV2 infection uh, was prevalent infection, little association, similar to the association that's been described in heterosexuals, that perhaps this is due to, uh, due to the ulcerative disease that's associated with the early phase of HSV2 infection. Um, we uh, did a study uh, in Sydney here, uh, which uh, are presented at this conference. I think the um, we're not seeing all of it on this um, slide, I'm afraid, but um, the data are presented tomorrow in a poster for those of you who are interested. Jeff Jin is the first author of this work. Um, so in this study, prevalent HSV2 was not associated with a subsequent HIV infection, but of great interest, pre pre prevalent HSV1 was associated with an increased risk of HIV infection. And in, in data that we published from this study last year in the Journal of Infectious Disease, HSV1 is very much a sexually transmitted infection in this cohort, um, particularly in young gay men. So these men are probably uh, getting HSV1 in a variety of anatomical locations, including the mouth, but also including the, the genitals and the anus. So it's plausible that HSV1 is, is exerting an effect on HIV ac acquisition in much the same way as HS HSV2 is um, through the genital lesions. So that's all observational data, but it leads to the very important question of whether we should be treating people who are seropositive for HSV2 to prevent HIV infection as part of the HIV uh, prevention <coughs> repertoire, if you like. 
Um, and I should say that the data from many of these epidemiological data suggests that the increased risk is independent of the occurrence of symptoms. So it's, it would not simply be a matter of identifying symptomatic individuals and treating them for their recurrences, as clinicians would do anyway. It might be a matter of actually screening populations at risk and treating all those who are seropositive. That question is unanswered, I must, must emphasise. So all, all of that data is observational, and really we do need uh, randomised controlled trials. And I want to spend a few minutes updating you on um, HBT and 039, although some of you will have been in a session this morning where data from, I believe, the first randomised controlled trial of this evidence were presented, and I'll try to summarise that from my memory uh, after HPT and 039. So this is a trial of HSV2 suppressive therapy to prevent HIV in amino have sex with men in the US and Peru and women in various locations in South Africa, in those three countries, Zambia, Zimbabwe and South Africa. Um, the eligibility criteria, uh, HIV negative women and HIV negative uh, men who have sex with men at risk of HIV, so with behavioural um, requirements that put them at risk of HIV. Up to 18 months of follow-up with monthly visits, quite an intensive follow-up schedule with a lot of adherence counsel, a lot of focus on adherence in this study because of the, the knowledge that um, we will only get suppression of herpes if people take drugs uh, regularly and quarterly visits for HIV testing. Uh, and using um, high quality assays for both HIV and HSV2. Those of you who have worked in herpes for long, for, for long will recognise the bright blue of Connie Kellum's slides and I, uh, I have acknowledged them. They're, they're, they're on the, um, the HIV Prevention Trials Network website which I would really recommend to you who are interested in this, in this field. It's an excellent research website. Uh, so this summarises the design of the study. 1,400 women, 1,900 high risk men who have sex with men, randomised to a cyclovir twice daily or placebo. Uh, both arms are treated if they develop. Um, um, genital ulcer disease, and the end point of this, in, of this study is prevention of HIV. Um, you see the estimated rate of HIV infection very high in these populations of about 3.5 per cent per year. And impressively, this study is now completely enrolled. Um, and these, these are slides that were presented at an HBTN retreat just in the last couple of months, which um, should show a, a pretty up-to-date um, status of these trials. So they've enrolled nearly 3,300 uh, individuals who've now been randomised to those uh, to acyclovir or placebo. Um, so it's fully enrolled, uh, it's got very good retention, nearly 90% at 12 months. Uh, that we are assured that there will be sufficient endpoints to measure efficacy. The last participant exiting in just a few months time and results are anticipated by early next year. So this is a question that we will have an answer to reasonably soon. Uh, particularly in this study we have very high adherence, at least by pill count, of 94%. Before I move on to HIV transmission, prevention of transmission. For those of you who weren't in that session this morning, it was a, a trial out of Tanzania um, which uh, presented data on a randomised control trial of similar design in about 800 high-risk women in that setting. And um, unfortunately, the, the study found no protective efficacy of treatment for a suppressive therapy for herpes. Um, but in an on-treatment analysis, a suggestion that among those women who were highly adherent, that there may have been a protective efficacy. The relative risk, I think, was 0.54, but was not significant. Um, so I think that study uh, has emphasised the need for adherence to anti-herpes therapy. And, and in fact, I don't know if there's anybody from the study in the audience. It would be lovely if there was. No? <laughs> um, but uh, that study found um, adherence of, of lower than 90%, more in the 70% um, range, and with a suggestion that if you actually measure adherence by looking for acyclovir, acyclovir metabolites in urine, that um, actual um, adherence may be lower than that measured by pill count. Uh, 